We're gonna get started here in just a minute. Um, Judith Courier, welcoming you all here today for this webinar. Um, as you're getting settled, please take a moment to answer the demographic questions which should be appearing on your screen. Well, as people start to uh, finish coming in, I think we'll go ahead and get started. We have um, an hour plus 15 minutes for questions at the end. Um, as I said, I'm Judith Courier from the University of California in Los Angeles. And it's my great pleasure to be here today with Dr. Stephen Grinspoon, who's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and um, head of the metabolism unit. And for the last 10 years with a very dedicated group of investigator has been working to, to try to address the issue about cardiovascular disease prevention in people living with HIV. And we're thrilled to have Steve here today to really walk through the results of the, the reprieve trial. Uh, and then we'll have some time at the end for, for questions and answers. Uh, we do have a few introductory slides first before Steve um, takes the helm. Um, <clears throat> the first are just the disclosures for um, the people who are involved in the content on the web or the um, listed here. The, the next slide is the um, disclosures for the presenter and moderator, that'd be Dr. Grinspoon and myself. Um, the IAS USA designates this live activity for a maximum of 1.25 CME credits. Um, the webinar is also approved for 1.25 hours of ABIM mock points um, and nursing pharmacy and pharmacology credit, ph pharmacotherapy credits. The contributors for this uh, event are listed on this slide, and we're thankful for their support. And then also as a reminder, um, the um, questions today, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A, and please feel free to start populating those as we go along. Um, we will also have polling questions during the, um, the webinar to uh, see where people are and they're thinking about the topics. Um, and <clears throat> the chat is open, but please don't put your questions in the chat. And if you forget and you do, we'll move them over to the Q&A. So, okay. So without further ado, turning it over now to Steve to, uh, to tell us about the Reprieve trial. Steve, thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, it's really a pleasure, Judy. Thank you so much. And thank you to the whole IAS team for this invitation. And it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, let me just share my screen for one second. Can you all see that? Okay, all right. Um, again, it's really a pleasure to be here today. It's really such a nice occasion to talk to you about the results of the pre reprieve trial, which I think will be practice changing in uh, among people with HIV. Uh, these are my disclosures, you saw them already. And uh, the first poll question I would like to ask is at the, current, at the current time, do you routinely assess for cardiovascular risk in your patients with HIV without any symptoms or history of cardiovascular disease? Uh, a yes or a no on that. Good. Well, many of you do, not everyone. Hopefully we can convince the remaining 17% after, uh, after, this, after the talk, but thank, that's great. Fantastic. Um, um, next slide. Um, do you provide comprehensive primary care to the people with HIV in your practice? Yes or no? Okay, um, an interesting split here. Um, 
the majority do, but a significant minority do not. And this is interesting because um, a lot of the complications are really do fall under primary care treatment guidelines, et cetera. So we will uh, we'll discuss that as we move along. Perfect. Okay, so on completion of this activity, hopefully you'll be able to describe the results of the reprieve trial in people with HIV and appropriately monitor people for HIV for cardiovascular disease and determine the optimal use of primary prevention strategies in this population. I'd like to ask now a pretest question, um, which I'll ask, and we won't discuss the answers as I understand it yet, but we'll see the answers. Uh, I hope that's true. Uh, and then discuss them. Uh, and you'll take this question at the end as well. But what is the main cause of cardiovascular disease in people with HIV? So there's four answers, potential answers. Uh, cardiovascular disease in people with HIV uh, is due in large part uh, from antiretroviral therapies, which can lead to metabolic abnormalities and account for the bulk of excess risk in people with HIV. Uh, cardiovascular disease in people with HIV is caused by the increased age of people with HIV, a population in which one would expect increased cardiovascular disease. Uh, the third answer, cardiovascular disease in people with HIV is due to increased LDL, low-density lipoprotein, making it an ideal target for statin therapy. And four, cardiovascular disease in people with HIV is caused by a combination of traditional and non-traditional risks, including inflammatory and immune-mediated uh, uh, mechanisms. So I think we'll see the answers to those. Well... Good, I'm glad you're thinking this way, fantastic, thank you. Okay, we'll talk more about this. Uh, next slide, um, the, the data from Reprieve suggest efficacy and overall utility of statins to prevent cardiovascular disease in low to moderate traditional risk people with HIV who are in the 40 to 75 year age range. So possible answers are yes, based on efficacy and lack of unanticipated adverse effects. No, the efficacy was shown to be marginal. No, because significant interactions with antiretroviral therapy were shown in the reprieve results. Or no, because the efficacy for major adverse cardiovascular event reduction was not seen among people developing diabetes mellitus in the trial. Um, let's see the answers to those. Good, perfect. Okay, let's move on to the talk. Um, so cardiovascular disease uh, is increasing with people with HIV and it's contributing to a persistent comorbidity gap. On the left, upper hand left uh, panel, you see that in the general population, cardiovascular disease is decreasing, but among HIV infected uh, patients with HIV, it's increasing, it's unusual. Down on the lower right, making two points. One, although antiretroviral therapy has been effective and is decreasing the mortality gap among people with HIV, you can see the top two bars are narrowing here, top two lines. There is a persistent comorbidity gap and the comorbidity free years remain persistently elevated in people with HIV and even while the mortality gap is closing. So what makes up this comorbidity gap? And the story I'm gonna tell you today is that in large part, this is due to cardiovascular disease. So why do we do reprieve? So people with HIV demonstrate increased cardiovascular disease. Multiple epidemiological studies suggest a 50 to 100% increase as well as excess car coronary plaque even controlling for traditional risk, and even at a young age. So that question I asked before, yes, there's advanced aging and disease that's unanticipated in younger patients with HIV, but in general, patients with HIV are young. So it's not as if they're older, they're younger with atypical disease for a young age. Um, and you correctly identified that. ART reduces comorbidities. We know that from the famous SMART study, but residual immune activation persists 
even with good viral suppression. It's a really important point. So ART alone is not sufficient to prevent cardiovascular disease. It's a critical point. Statins lower LDL cholesterol, a main driver of CVD in pe people with HIV, but also they affect residual immune activation and inflammation, including among people with HIV. And the trick I was trying to get you to bite on on the other question was, yes, statins are really effective to lower LDL, but LDL is not elevated, particularly in people with HIV, which makes using a statin so interesting in this population. Now, patavastatin is a moderate intensity statin. It's unaffected by antiretroviral therapy with good LDL and anti-inflammatory properties. And we hypothesized that patavastatin would prevent MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events, through these effects in people with HIV, even those at low to moderate risk for whom statins are not typically prescribed under current guidelines. So let's dive into the reprieve study. Um, this is a study which was recruit, re, uh, recruited globally and um, the patient attributable risk of cardiovascular disease among patients with HIV is shown by the red intensity. And you can see that uh, that's highest in Sub-Saharan Africa. And indeed we recruited patients across Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, um, and Asia. So this is truly a global study. To get into Reprieve, we recruited participants 40 to 75 without known atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Therefore, it is a primary prevention trial. And uh, you have to recruit a lot of patients to prevent. It's harder to prevent a disease than to treat a disease, which uh, made uh, Reprieve unique in, in that regard. Um, that in order to get into reprieve, we used the pool cohort equation, 10-year ASCVD risk score. And we had a sliding scale um, based on the score and LDL. So the lower the score, the higher your LDL could be. So that if you had an L, if you had an AS uh, pool cohort equation score of less than 7.5, we would allow the LDL to be up to 190 between 7.5 and 10, less than 160, and between 10 and 15, less than 130. So it was a sliding scale. You will see as I present this data that overall the LDL level was quite low uh, overall, and therefore um, that was not a major risk in this particular group. Um, we also excluded participants who were currently using statins, gemfibrozole or PCSK9 inhibitors, we did allow the use of statins. Uh, patients were allowed to go on clinical statins, I should say, during the trial. They would be censored at that point, but we wanted to ensure equipoise. And if uh, clinicians thought they deserved a clinical statin, that was allowed. And we were following followed such patients under intent to treat principles. And I'll talk about how many patients crossed over like that uh, a little bit later on in the talk. Not many, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, so this is the overall design of Reprieve. Again, asymptomatic people with HIV on ART with low to moderate risk, 7,769 participants. Uh, simple design, randomized to placebo or patavastatin. Uh, as I mentioned, patavastatin is, uh, is a, a moderate intensity statin that has no interactions, significant interactions with antiretroviral therapy. I will discuss other statins later and applicability of our results uh, later to other statins. Uh, the primary endpoint was MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events, including CVD death, MI, unstable angina, TIA stroke, arterial revascularization, or peripheral artery disease. In, in addition, we had secondary endpoints. We'll look at predictors of statin effects, individual components, inflammatory, immunological, and metabolic biomarkers, and of course, safety, not AIDS, comorbidities, diabetes, infections, and cancer. We've done a lot of this work so far. I'll present you everything that we have, but we've not done all of it yet. And uh, so there is more work to come. Embedded in Reprieve is a mechanistic study of 800 patients, uh, primarily at ACTG sites in the United States, um, as opposed to the global nature of the main Reprieve. 
And here we looked at coronary plaque, vascular inflammation, and immune activation to try and tease out what the mechanisms of this effect would be. And we've made some, some progress on analyzing that data. So in terms of our enrollment, it is global, as I mentioned. Um, the total number enrolled, you can see here, divided by global burden of disease region, high income Latin America and Caribbean, Southeast, East Asia, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, you can see that 53% were from high income, which means 47% were not. Uh, and that includes Latin America and other regions. Uh, proudly, 15% were from Sub-Saharan Africa. So total, very diverse global cohort, increasing the generalizability of these results. The baseline characteristics of reprieve are shown here. I do break it up into the patavastatin and placebo columns, but you don't have to look at those two columns. Just look at the total column. They are very identical in this large RCT, so there's no differences between the groups. So just look at the total column right here. And you can, I wanna make a couple of points about this. First of all, getting again to that first question, the median age was only 50 in this study. This is a very young age uh, for a statin study. It's the youngest age of any prior statin primary prevention trial. 31% um, were female, which is a large percentage and has enabled us to do some very important work on se sex stratification and mechanisms. Um, in terms of race, only 35% were white, meaning 65% were non-white. So we're able to make important, draw important conclusions about from about race and about effects in different GBD regions. The CD4 count was well preserved at 621. The Nader CD4 count is shown here. We're doing some interesting work relating the Nader CD4 count to disease in upcoming MACE and upcoming analyses. Everyone was on antiretroviral therapy. That was a requirement of the study. So the vast majority had undetectable and the small majority that had detectable, the median copy number was in the 60s, very low. And we use different assays around the world, you can imagine. So there's some differences in the assays and minimums used. But suffice it to say that the vast majority had undetectable viral load consistent with antiretroviral therapy use. I want to point out that the median ASCVD risk score was 4.5. And the vast majority of primary care physicians, and now I think HIV providers are going to need to become primary care physicians in this regard, are not treated at 4.5%. So this is a really uh, important point I'm gonna make over and over again in the trial, and it makes reprieve very different and unique. The LDL was only 108. Um, again, as I mentioned, high statins lower LDL, and they did in this trial, I'll tell you about it, but then at the, at the beginning, the baseline LDL was not particularly high in reprieve. In terms of antiretroviral therapy use, as you can imagine, there were different regimens across different regions. For example, integrase inhibitors um, uh, were in use in some, in some regions, but not in others. Um, and so, um, that's an important point to make. And we're going to do further studies to look at how, whether different classes of antiretroviral therapy affect MACE in the placebo group or whether there was an interaction with statins. So far, we're not seeing a signal, but we need to do more work in that regard. I want to point out that um, the, uh, the median duration of ART use coming into the trial was long. And so 48%, for example, had over 10 plus years of use. So this is a chronically treated, virologically suppressed, asymptomatic, no known heart disease population, age 50 with a low CBD risk. The vast majority of clinicians in the United States and around the world today would say, okay, come back next year. Um, I'm not gonna bother treating you. And that's what really makes Reprieve so interesting. So um, what happened with Reprieve? So Reprieve is an events-driven trial with 85% power to detect a hazard ratio of 0. 0.7 with 288 planned events. So that may be confusing lingo to people, but what that means, the bottom line is, we, ex we thought we would have enough patients to detect a 30% reduction 
in events. I want you to remember that number. Um, in early April, the Data Safety Monitoring Board convened at 75% of information. This was a pre-planned meeting and they actually closed the trial early for efficacy. And they concluded that there were no unanticipated safety concerns and that the benefits outweighed the risk of statin therapy in this group. There was no longer equipoise to continue a randomized trial. Uh, we were very happy. We were very pleased. We were, uh, couldn't believe it. And you know, we've now been in, uh, trying to analyze this mountain of data that was unblinded early. The primary results were published uh, recently in the New England Journal, and I would encourage you to read that, including the supplements. And if any of you have individual questions that you don't get a chance to ask me in the Q&A today, you're, I'm happy to take emails from you and try and explain the results uh, to you. Or invite me to give a lecture. I'm happy, we're happy to send myself or anyone on the team to, to talk to your group. Okay, so the duration of follow-up at the time that the study was stopped by the DSMB was five years. So even though I've been working on Reprieve for 10 years, by the time we planned it, got it funded, got it recruited, took four years to recruit it, the median duration is, was only five years. So the risk we're seeing uh, was over five years and the reduction in the signal was seen over a relatively short period of time. This is a, a short period of time to see a signal in a primary prevention study. Here are the primary results of Reprieve. If you remember nothing else, just remember this slide. Um, on the left is the primary endpoint, first MACE, and there was a 35% reduction versus placebo. You see the curves are clearly splitting. On the right is a key pre-specified secondary endpoint, which is first MACE or death of any cause. And here we also showed a significant effect, minus 21%. So a very significant reduction in MACE and death in this uh, group of patients. Some key additional findings. Greater than 80% in both groups remained in follow-up. Adherence was very good to excellent in the great majority of participants. Adverse event-related discontinuation was low in each group, 2% versus 1%, tabistatin versus placebo. That issue that I mentioned before of initiating a non-study statin, that's called crossover, that occurred in 5.7% of the tabistatin group and 9.6% of placebo-treated participants below the threshold of concern. If you think about it, the reason it was a little bit less in tabistatin is because patients were having less disease. So clinicians blinded felt less of a need to start a clinical statin. So the crossover rates were fine and as anticipated in this study, which is really important to, for the integrity of the study. All events after the global pandemic um, started were adjudicated for COVID. This is important because COVID has been associated with death in cardiovascular disease. So we adjudicated every event to make sure it wasn't a COVID-related event. And only one MACE event was definitely related. Parenthetically, we now have data to look at um, statins vis-a-vis -vis COVID. There was a paper in the New England Journal just yesterday, I think. And uh, we have some very interesting results, which we'll be presenting uh, at CROI in this regard. So let's talk about the primary endpoints and the components of the primary endpoints. So the top part of this figure just shows, here's the primary, redu primary result, 35% reduction. Again, that was more than the anticipated reduction of 30%. And it was true in uh, while on treatment and per protocol strategies, any way you did it, it was significant. P-value was 0.002. I want to drop down to this section right here where we look at individual components of MACE. And I want to just draw your attention to the point estimates. When you get into subgroups, you really can't look at the confidence intervals so much anymore because you're not powered for subgroup analysis. This is just to look at the sort of overall consistency of the effect across multiple endpoints. So first of all, you see a very, very consistent set of effects. There's one that has, Peripheral arterial revasc has an, e has an even greater effect, but that's a very small number of events. So 
I would discount this, but it's certainly in the right right direction. Um, but here you see a consistency. Now, another point is that if you look at heart attacks on the first line or strokes on the second line, you notice a very similar effect size, but there were equal number of strokes, if you add up these two numbers, 29 and 44, and heart attacks add up 26 and 47, which to us was very, very interesting. We knew there were increased strokes in people with HIV, but at such a young age they're occurring, and we were able to prevent them with uh, statin therapy. So not only does this prevent heart attacks, but also strokes in this population. And why this population is having strokes Really, we need to do more research on that and coronary artery disease as well. Now, here we're looking at effects on key subgroups. All these figures are published in the New England Journal. Again, we're not looking so much at confidence intervals, but general consistency of effects across subgroups. And there was a general consistency of effects. There was no treatment modification based on the baseline LDL. So whether you had an LDL less than 130 or more than 130, kind of the upper limit of normal, um, you had the same protective effect, which to us was absolutely fascinating. Um, <clears throat> so that's sort of saying that this effect is independent of baseline LDL and your baseline LDL may not matter that much. Uh, and indeed, newer guidelines and newer therapies are more holistic in terms of overall risk um, de-emphasizing LDL per se, but we can talk more about that. Um, the results are generally consistent across race and GBD regions. You can see here, um, we saw a super significant effect in South Asia, um, a similar effect in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and we can talk more about why that is. We, there may be more relative increases in um, visceral adiposity and waist circumference and insulin resistance in that area. There was a lot of diabetes in India, so we can, we can talk more about that. But in general, a consistent effect. There was no treatment modification based on CD4, Nader CD4, HIV RNA, or ART duration, although we've not yet looked yet at regimen per se. Um, and this next slide is the effects on LDL. The teal greenish violin plots are the placebo and, and the middle dot is the median. So you can see you could almost draw a line across the whole study. There was no drift, it was very stable. But in the purple violin plots, it went down from 108 to 77 in the 70s or so. So it was about a 30% reduction in LDL. So although it wasn't high, we did reduce it nicely, and um, that's important. Um, this is the non-HDL similar effect. And importantly, the effect was durable over time, amazing over such a long duration of a trial that patients hung in there with us, took their assigned treatment, and uh, we maintained the randomized effect over the entire duration of the study. LDL is a really good marker for that, that we would maintain this randomization. So I'd like to talk about the effect in the effects and reprieve and implications. So this is a, uh, a graph that plots on the x-axis, the mean LDL difference between treatment groups. And this is a meta regression of many large statin prevention trials, okay? And so if you look at this line, there's a regression line and you see these different trials and this is the imputed regression line. And uh, on the y-axis is the proportional reduction in MACE rate. So we had uh, a 0.8, uh, this is a British analysis, so we use millimoles, but the point is uh, taken anyway, that we had about a 0.8 millimole reduction or about a 35 milligram per deciliter reduction in LDL. And you go up to the regression line and you go over, and you see that the predicted reduction in MACE was 17% based on a meta regression. But we were up here. So we had a 35% reduction and we kind of term this additional efficacy. And so we're not saying that the reduction in LDL doesn't matter, it does, and it's probably contributing to the effect, but there's something happening beyond the reduction in LDL. It's a larger effect than what's expected for LDL lowering alone. 
So that's an interesting point that we're working on very hard as to what is the what is the mechanism of that? Is it an effect on inflammatory factors, immune factors, plaque stabilization, so many different reasons. And all of them are in our sites as we try to uh, define what our mechanisms were of this study, this result. Let's turn to uh, safety. So uh, safety is really important. And if you have questions on this, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, the DSMB concluded that there were no unanticipated safety concerns. So they were expert in HIV and cardiology and had participated in prior primary prevention trials and they knew what other statins had done in other trials. So no unanticipated safety concerns. The serious adverse events were similar in each group, almost exactly one, the IRR. Um, Muscle-related symptoms were higher in the patavastatin group, 2% versus 1%, but were mostly mild, and only 1% went through for muscle-related symptomatology. So the, the really small number that went through for muscle-related symptoms, and I'll show you that shortly. The diabetes rates were increased in the patavastatin group, so that's important. The actual numbers on a prevalence basis were 5.3% in the patavastatin group. So you might say, well, that's, that's not trivial, but it was 4% in the placebo group. So you have to use the subtracted difference. And you know why the HIV group at this age is having a 4% diabetes rate is a whole other story that we need to investigate. We have a whole set of diabetes um, studies planned on this data. But the increase in the diabetes rate was consistent with that seen in prior statin studies. And it was not, these rates were not significantly above rates demonstrated for the general population. And very, very few withdrew, to di withdrew due to diabetes, I think two patients in the whole study. So uh, fairly mild effect in that regard. There was no effect on grade three uh, liver enzymes or on rhabdomyolysis. So that was really, really reassuring in terms of liver tests and muscle function. This is a slide in which we delve further into the diabetes aspects. The top line is the incidence rate for placebo, and this is for patavastatin. So you can see that there is a difference um, between the groups, which is why there's an increased rate of diabetes that we show. This is the rate of uh, diabetes in the US general population. It's not an exactly fair comparison because we're not using global data, but it's informative. So this is the rate of diabetes critically in patients age 45 to 64. So you have to do that comparison. That's the same age as the reprieve patients. And you can see something interesting here. Yes, there is a difference, but the confidence intervals in each of the group are really overlapping with the general population rate. So not a huge difference. Um, also, there were 12 MACE events in participants with diabetes. And this is what I was trying to get you on in the question, but you, you saw through my uh, question. Um, there were 12 MACE events in, in participants with diabetes, but the effect, the protective effect of patavastatin was maintained. It's hard to do statistics on such small numbers, but only four people in the got a, uh, with, uh, with diabetes got MACE event in the patavastatin group versus eight in the placebo. So even though there was some diabetes, overall, there was still a protective effect on MACE considering that there was some diabetes in the study, which is a very important concept. And when you look at glucose, uh, you just don't see much of anything in terms of changes between statin and placebo in reprieve. So very consistent effects uh, on glucose. Now let's talk about muscle aches and myalgias. Um, each pair of bars represents the patavastatin group or the placebo group, the patavastatin in purple and teal and the placebo. And the different shades within each bar represent the different grades of AE. So only the yellow is a grade four AE. So when you zoom out of this and look at this, even if you look at the worst grade reported for the year um, in muscle aches or muscle weakness, you see there's a lot of muscle aches in the placebo group. Again, totally randomized trial, blinded. So there's a lot of lack of specificity in that. Uh, and happily, very few people in either group had 
grade four. Um, and in fact, when you look at the number of people who had to withdraw for muscle-related symptomatology, it was 44 in the batavastatin group and like 20 plus or so in the 22 or something in the placebo group. So relatively small and not a huge absolute difference. We found this very, very reassuring. It's a uh, slide in, uh, in the supplement of the paper that you can find it, um, that we just published. So let's talk about guidelines for a minute because I think this is really, really important. If um, uh, putting on your hat as a primary care doctor, uh, if you do that, or if you want to do that, or maybe called to do that, if you look at the current guidelines by the American Heart Association, Amer ACC, it's a, like a hundred page document, but it boils down to this chart right here. So I, um, if you look at this chart, you can see some interesting things. So first of all, if you calculate the risk, which we did, uh, it divides the patients into different buckets. So I think everyone would agree that if you're in the high risk group, more than 20%, you shouldn't be on a placebo controlled trial. You should be on a statin. So we agree with that. We didn't allow these people in the trial and they were excluded for equipoise. So we're over here in the left in the red box, okay? And as I mentioned to you, the median risk was 4.5%, which would be in the low risk category, but half were above in the low to moderate range. But in all of these cases, there is no absolute recommendation for statins. It's a discussion. And uh, there was a, an asterisk that was added in uh, the prior most immediate guidelines suggesting to clinicians that inflammatory diseases, especially rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and HIV be considered ASCVD risk enhancers. Despite that, there was reticence to prescribe statin therapy because no one had any data, including efficacy or safety, to suggest the bold idea of actually <laughs> uh, prescribing it for patients over here in these kind of two risk areas. And I think Reprieve has now provided that data. So whereas it was previously unknown, Reprieve has taught us that this is the case that at least for in this global trial, um, statin therapy will prevent MACE in low to moderate risk people with HIV. And I can tell you that there are many guidelines committees now busily working on this to incorporate uh, reprieve into official guidelines. Let's talk about um, the relative risk score and disease and number needed to treat. So I wanna take you through this slide. So on the left, this is placebo. So none of these patients, none of these dots are uh, potavastatin treated patients. So you can see that in general, the um, higher your risk score, which is on the x-axis, the higher your rate of cardiovascular disease. So there is an, a, there is an, a sort of uh, a, a correlation, if you will, between higher risk score and disease. Whether this actually under predicts, it's kind of suggested by this, it's a little bit to the right of the teal line. And we're gonna do a more formal analysis of this, the exact degree that this under predicts. And um, also a little bit of analysis in women, which I'll tell you about may under predict more in women, which would be of significant importance to the field. On the right is a graph on number needed to treat. For those of you who are not familiar, number needed to treat is the number you need to treat to prevent one MACE event. So overall in the trial, it was 106. That's actually a pretty good number for large prevention trials. It's actually striking in that the overall risk was only 4.5%. In general, as your baseline risk goes up, see here, the number you treat goes down because you're, there's an enrichment of baseline risk. So you get a little bit more effective bang for your buck as, as the risk score goes up. And, uh, but overall in the study it was remarkably 106. Let's look at some different buckets here. So if you're more than 10% risk, you only need 35 patients to prevent, to treat 35 to prevent one mace. This is in line with what Jupiter showed, the Jupiter trial in which non-HIV patients were enrolled 
with normal LDL, but elevated CRP, kind of analogous to what we're doing in HIV. But they were 66 years old to start. They had a much higher baseline risk. And in general, um, uh, that was concordant. They had about a 35 number needed to treat. But interestingly to me and others is that even in these categories like five to 10 or 2.5 to five, you're seeing uh, reasonable numbers, particularly in the five to 10, you only need to treat 53 uh, participants uh, or patients to get an effect size, um, which, is, which is again, interesting and informative. And uh, you can also see this is also in the supplement of the New England Journal article. To put this in perspective, aspirin has about an NNT about 300 and hypertensive agents in, are in the 200s for primary prevention. So this is a very effective uh, strategy. There will be future studies coming out relating cost effectiveness, qualities and all that kind of stuff. But for now, we just have this analysis, a simple analysis of number needed to treat. Talk a little bit about uh, women. Um, and um, it was a mandate for us to recruit females into the study. We even had a campaign that Markella Zandi and Sarah Luby uh, chaired called Follow Your Heart. And we were required by NIH and wanted to enroll as many female patients as possible, including up to the number that was the that represented the percent among the population in that country. So for example, 23% of HIV patients in the United States are women, and we enrolled 23%. Um, we were a little bit off in some countries. We were a little bit ahead of the curve in others like Thailand. But overall, we were pretty good. And uh, overall, we had 31% uh, women in this trial. This is an important slide. This is in the placebo group. And here, we're looking at various risk strata, 0 to 2.5, 2.5 to 5, 5 to 10, and more than 10. Placebo only. And these risk estimates are for disease in men in the darker line or women in the lighter line. And you can see that after a score of 2.5% in each of these buckets, further and further differences. And guess which group has a higher risk? The women, which is absolutely fascinating because the risk score among women was only 1.9% coming into reprieve. 1.9%, whereas the men was much higher, like at five and a half, something like that. So why women who have a lower traditional risk score have more event rates, more events, is just a, a question that needs to be answered. And we were, we're digging into that now. So that implies perhaps, and we're gonna do analysis on that, that maybe the 10-year ASCBD risk score underestimates the risk in women more than men. And it's possible uh, that systemic immune activation not well captured by ASCB risk score is driving MACE to a greater extent in women versus men living with HIV. And we're going to do some analyses comparing the accuracy of the risk score. We're going to use some HIV-specific risk scores, um, like the DAD score, which incorporate HIV-related factors as opposed to the pool cohort equation, which we use, which does not incorporate HIV-related risk factors like CD4, et cetera, in them. So let's talk about statin availability and implementing the results of Reprieve. Technically, the results of Reprieve are specific to patavastatin. And interestingly, patavastatin, which is the only statin still on um, patent, will be coming off patent in November 2023. Yes, in a few days. So Patavastatin should be much more readily available and cheaper in generic um, versions very, very soon. Having said that, as of the moment now, it would be, it's available in many, many countries. It would have been available in, to about three quarters of the people in our reprieve, looking at the different countries, but it's not available in every country. So when patavastatin is not available either through local regulations or others, it's our opinion that consideration can be given to using other statins tolerated with ART. We can go over this more in the question and answer period. Um, I say this because I think that there are some generally some class specific effects and we ourselves have done other statin studies, for example, with a torvastatin showing 
uh, similar effects on plaque that we are seeing in our substudy in reprieve. But again, technically, this result is specific to patavastatin, and hopefully that'll be more available to clinicians and providers in the future. So if patavastatin is not available, what do you do? Well, I really encourage you to read this University of Liverpool interaction checker and to obviously check for interactions with your uh, HIV-related therapy. We know that protease inhibitors downregulate CYP3A4 and uh, can be increase the concentrations. And, but we don't really use protease inhibitors. And the drug that's most effective is, effective is atorvastatin. Cobastat inhibits CYP3A and can increase levels of statins very minor. Um, exceptions are patavastatin and pravastatin, which are not metabolized through CYP3A4. But as I mentioned, since protease inhibitors are not used that often, that brings it into the four other statins, which may be useful. Atorvastatin and resuvastatin may be used in those on a PI, but should be initiated at low doses and titrated carefully. Efavirenz can induced statin metabolism, metabolism resulting in a lower level. According to the FDA package insert, none of these have significant interactions with patavastatin. So if you boil this all down together, the recommended statins in HIV would include pravastatin, a more low, um, low intensity statin, and atorvastatin and resuvastatin, which are more high intensity statins, and patavastatin, which is a, a medium intensity statin. And I'm happy to answer further questions on that later. Let's talk for a minute about the mechanistic study um, embedded in Reprieve. And we published the baseline data of the mechanistic study in a JAMA network open a couple of years ago. And we saw, uh, surprisingly, that 50% of the patients in Reprieve without known risk within a risk score of 4.5%, 50% had plaque. And even among patients in a low risk category, for example, less than 5%, you know, 30% or so uh, uh, had plaque, uh, more, had more than one to two plaques. So that's really significant. So we see this uh, really in patients with low risk uh, and low to moderate risk this prevalence of plaque that's not really easily explained by traditional risk. We also saw that specific immune markers, for example, monocyte activation markers in IL-6 were very significantly related to plaque independent of traditional risks. We also saw markers of arterial inflammation were significantly related. Not so much CRP. So CRP is a more generalized marker of inflammation, which, um, in our hands was not as determinate as other markers. And we're really interested in knowing the effects of the tabistatin on these markers and whether that affects MACE in our population. Um, and we're also doing uh, proteomic and transcriptomic analyses to really understand at a more mechanistic level, proteins and gene signatures of the changes and whether we can predict who might uh, have an uh, improved MACE response using statin therapy and the mechanism of that effect. Now, I want to just show you some histology slides to, to round this out a little bit. Um, in general, when you have a coronary artery, you have a plaque that can develop. And if it's a stable plaque, it actually is more calcified and it actually has uh, a very stable, thicker sort of surface. And if you look at these stable plaques, this is not HIV, but just in general, and you look with histology in a stable plaque, such as this on top, you see very little infiltration of immune uh, activated cells that are marked by CD206, CD163, CD68. You can see very little up here. But if you look at a high-risk plaque, and 23% of HIV, people with HIV had high-risk plaque on our, on our CT study. So though this is not a picture of them, it's informative for that. If you look at high-risk plaque, which is, this looks very nasty, this particular plaque, and these plaques have thin cap fibroatheroma, so the cap is very thin and it can rupture. If you look at the subendothelial surface in these plaques, you see that they're chock full of immune activated cells, particularly um, macrophage marked cells. So that's really interesting. And we've taken this a step further 
in people with HIV, we used a molecular imaging agent, a macrophage specific imaging agent, which uh, is specific to CD206. And we showed very significant increases. This is the arch of the aorta coming over here compared to non-HIV participants. And it's our hope that we'll be able to show in reprieve that statins reduced arterial inflammation and that that may affect MACE as one of our hypotheses. So what are the next steps for the main study? Um, we're going to assess um, cardiovascular uh, disease mechanisms across global burdens of disease regions and key, key groups by race, sex, and region, assess mechanisms of MACE reduction and LDL lowering versus effects on inflammation, including lipid oxidation and plaque stabilization, identify statin effects on non-CBD events, including COVID, uh, and assess accuracy of the pool cohort equation. For people with HIV with low to moderate risk, reprieve suggests the a benefit of statin therapy to reduce MACE, but this decision should be a shared decision-making process between individuals and clinicians who should consider all relevant factors, including risks of statins and benefits, including but not limited to the results of reprieve. And this may include drug interactions, metabolic factors, and patient preferences. Importantly, just you know, on top of using a statin or not using a statin, we should always emphasize a heart healthy lifestyle, ideal diets, counseling on smoking, blood pressure, dyslipidemia, and other CBD risks. So, in conclusion, despite HIV be con being considered a risk equivalent, which I showed you in the current guidelines, no prior trial has assessed a primary prevention strategy for this group who would not typically be recommended for statin therapy. Among people with HIV age 40 to 75 on ART with low to moderate risk and normal range LDL, treatment with metamostatin is effective and prevents MACE. And I think consideration should be given to expanding treatment guidelines in this regard. So I'm not sure I need to go through these questions again since you already got the answers largely correctly, but just to emphasize a few points um, that I think what I've shown you is that cardiovascular disease in people with HIV is caused by a combination of traditional and non-traditional risks. And uh, these non-traditional risks relate to immune activation. LDL um, is not increased, particularly in people with HIV. It is a target of statin therapy, but statins work in reprieve despite the patients, participants not having a high LDL. Um, patients with HIV are young. They have an increased risk of CBD despite being young. So they're not increased in age, if anything. And yes, in the old eras of antiretroviral therapies, these could cause insulin resistance and diabetes and all sorts of things. But the newer agents, particularly integrase, are not. Now, integrases our inhibitors are unique in terms of weight gain. And we have studies planned for reprieve in which we're looking in the placebo group about integrase inhibitor switchers and whether that was associated with weight gain and cardiovascular disease and comparing a back of ear and other strategies. So stay tuned for that. But in the main, I think it's not so much antiretroviral therapies that are causing this, but residual immune activation on top of um, uh, on top of antiretroviral therapy, um, which needs treatment. This also raises the raises the question of if you reduce it thirty five percent, you know, what else could you use, or do you need something else? And I think um, from talking with Judy, there will be a symposium at Croy addressing other aspects of this, which I would encourage you to go to. Um, so I already went over the correct answer. And uh, do the data, so the data from Reprieve do suggest it's, it's efficacious based on lack of unanticipated adverse effects. No efficacy, um, so um, the, the effect size was not marginal. If anything, it was large. There were not significant interactions with ART. And um, I showed you a very specific slide that among the patients with MACE and diabetes, the MACE rate was less in those with metabostatin therapy. So, but you guys guessed this correctly. So I think I'd like to stop here. And uh, these are some suggested readings and thank the IAS USA for the invitation to speak and to our participants, site teams, funders, entire reprieve team for making this possible. It certainly took a village. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.
Thank you, Steve. That was really fantastic. You covered a, a lot and you actually addressed a lot of the questions that have come in that came in before, but um, there's some terrific questions here. So I think we'll just jump right into it. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> try to lump some of them together. Um, one area of questions is around estimating cardiovascular risk in people with HIV. So the first one was, was this a 10-year risk or lifetime risk that was calculated for the study? It was a 10-year risk, which this is a really good question. It's a 10-year risk. Um, so there's a couple aspects I can uh, embellish on that. So first of all, if you think about it, every year you get older, the risk is going up. So it's interesting that it's a changing dynamic risk, but um, it's a 10-year risk. Our trial duration was only five years. So we can't just go back and apply the exact equation to our data. We have to go back and luckily for the pool cohort equation and for dad, there are five-year equations that are out there. So we will be able to apply the five-year risk to our five-year duration and be able to determine whether it underpredicts or not. Um, and I suspect it may, but stay tuned for that. that. That's an important question. And really the concept is that there's, um, even though this is a 10-year predicted risk, your, your risk is patients, participants with HIV will have a lifetime risk of inflammation if you think about it. So, you know, um, uh, I, 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 I think of it that way that, you know, if you want to put a therapy on, you're not only preventing risk across the next five to 10 years, but probably over a much longer period of time, although the equations don't measure that. Yeah, and I think as you pointed out, the risk equation, you know, we're, the study is going to teach us more about a more accurate way to predict risk, and there may be differences by sex. Um, there was a question from Tonya Petit about those transgender participants. Which gender was used in the pooled risk equation? Was it sex at birth? Sex or, at birth. Okay. Sex at birth, yeah. I think that's this is a group that there's certainly a need to learn more. Yeah, about. there were there there's some it wasn't a huge number of participants, but it was enough to get some information out of um what are the specific risks. We have published um some data on this group. Um we're particularly interested in whether um gender affirming therapy um increases risk and we won't have enough to look at mace but we'll have enough to look at some of the risks and so it's a very important group to study uh and um we we use the um, sex at birth yep. so a lot of questions about availability of patavastatin um medicaid adap i think some of these things may vary state to state and as you pointed out with the drug coming off patent next month may also be in evolution but can, can you just state again, if you are not able to get patavastatin at, at this moment or not available, um, your preference for alternatives? Yeah. So it ha I don't want to make a global statement because every decision is individualized. And so like if someone was on a prote happened to be on a protease inhibitor, you know, I probably would change what I'm about to say. But in general, the nice thing is that there's generic a torvastatin out there. And our study that we published in Lancet HIV a couple of years ago, we started with 20 milligrams that went to 40 and saw a beautiful effect on plaque. We did not see any significant interactions. Um, you could use pravastatin. It's a weaker statin. It's very, very widely available as is generic atorva, but it's a relatively low intensity statin. Resuvastatin, you could use resuvastatin, but of all the statins, resuvastatin has the highest risk of diabetes. So I might, if you had my personal preference, I'd probably say atorvastatin. But again, I don't want to be overly dogmatic about it because I don't know what any individual patient is on. And I would really encourage people to look at the um, Liverpool interaction uh, checker um, to look at specific, you know, plugging in the different meds people are on. Um, so. Uh, I, I do think patavastatin is a little more difficult to get now because it's the only drug on patent. And you might say, well, why did you use that? But, but it, it, we used it because it, has, it was shown in the Intrepid trial led by Judy Aberg to have a very good effect on LDL lowering. 
a very good anti-inflammatory effect to be well tolerated and not interfere with ART. And so that's why we used it. But um, I think the good news here is that people have a lot of different options. Um, and this is not a, you know, generic statins are like a dollar a day per pill. This is not a high price therapy. And I think the cost effective analyses are going to show this to be an effective therapy, particularly when this comes off patent. And just with your endocrine background, can you shed any light on why it's thought that some statins or statins do seem to have some impact on diabetes development mechanistically? You know, it's curious that the most high intensity ones do. So um, there have been um, Mendelian um, randomization studies which show that lowering LDL is associated with diabetes. So it may be something to do with the HMG-CoA pathway and oxidative stress. I don't know. Um, I, I think the, the jury is still out on that, but it is kind of related to intensity of statin. And in, in a certain way, patavastatin being a moderate statin is kind of the best of everything. It's, it's, you know, it gets the job done, but it's not horribly toxic or, but it, it's also, if you ask me, is it as effective as 80 of a Torvastatin? No way, it's not, you know, you'll get a much better LDL lowering, but do you need that in someone with an LDL of 108? That's why I also want to be individualized. If someone comes to your clinic that has a very high LDL, I mean, think, don't take my word, but please look at the different statins. You'll get a better LDL lowering with certain high intensity statins. So you might want to consider that. But I'm talking about the generic kind of patient that we uh, enrolled, enrolled in Reprieve. So it's a really a good question about the diabetes. Excellent question. So a couple of people have asked about VLDL. Was that accounted for at all? Um, um, we, um, we measured LDL directly if the triglyceride was over 500. So you can only use the Friedwald equation if the LDL the triglyceride is less than 500. That happened vanishingly rarely. We, um, we didn't measure uh, VLDL per se, but you can calculate it uh, with the Friedwald and you can, it's basically triglyceride divided by five. And so we, you might say, well, what did this drug do to triglycerides? And I wish I could tell you, except we don't have the data yet from Quest, but statins in, so, so first of all, the, the, you know, in general, HIV, patients with HIV do have a little bit of an increased triglyceride level, you know, uh, back in the day, uh, it was even higher, but it's, it's now it seems to be a bit lower. Um, and uh, we're going to take a look at what happens. Um, statins, high intensity statins, lower LDL, raise HDL, and lower triglyceride a teeny bit in the right direction, not a giant effect. I suspect that we will either show a modest effect or some kind of effect on on triglyceride. Um, there, is an, there is an increasing appreciation that triglycerides themselves um, may contribute to atherogenesis. So that's a very interesting question. But fascinatingly, the drug, there's been three or four trials now, you probably are familiar with them, of drugs that lower uh, triglycerides and only a few of them have been shown to be uh, positive. Now there, there is a kind of fish oil trial which showed a positive effect to reduce MACE. Um, and so, but not at the level of 35% we're showing here. I should also add that for those that are completely intolerant of statins, let's just say it ain't gonna work. <laughs> it just, you just can't get over muscle problems. There are other alternatives that affect LDL, like bempedoic acid is a very interesting drug. Uh, and I believe uh, Priscilla Shu is studying that in people with HIV and I applaud her for that. Um, it doesn't lower MACE as much as uh, statins do. So the big New England Journal paper had like a 17% reduction in MACE, but it's a hell of a lot better than doing nothing. So, um, you know, it hasn't been studied in a big trial like this, but so if, if you're, if you're flummoxed about it, you, you and your patient, and, and there are some patients who just, 
just can't tolerate a statin. I, everyone knows that. And, you know, you can go slow, go low, you can have a decision um, and you, but there are other alternatives too. Yeah, I think that's it. That was one of the other questions. Other okay. alternatives. Yeah, we're doing that study also at UCLA. With oh, great. And great. it can, that drug also can lead to some weight loss, which is an interesting yes. thing. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so there's questions about um, people that are sort of younger. And I, I just want to raise this issue about women. You know, you highlighted this sort of differential rates of disease um, and the study enrolled people over the age of 40. But can you talk about statins in women of childbearing age? Um, yeah. Um, there, in reprieve, if a woman got pregnant, they were taken off the study, period. Um, if you look at the data, and, and that is still the FDA recommendation, but if you look at the data, you know, it's not that clear that there's a teratogenic effect at all. And so, but I think the, the traditional teaching is that, you know, you don't want to be pregnant on a statin, but I think, you know, people shouldn't panic if they find out that they got pregnant on a statin. Um, and, and the nice thing about statins are that there's no withdrawal there's no giant rebound. Come off them. That's fine. Go back on them. That's fine. You know, and so I would recommend as per the guidelines that you would come off if you were pregnant. We made everyone do pregnancy testing and reprieve. And there were only a few uh, women that got pregnant. There was nothing we heard about, um, God forbid, that was bad that happened in those cases. Um, uh, but we were obviously allowed to have women in the study and had 31% uh, of females in the study. Okay. And then just sort of another kind of summary question based on the number needed to treat in these low risk scores, the zero to 2.5, 2.5 to five, you feel like the reprieve data essentially concludes that barring any contradictions, uh, every patient over the age of 40 with HIV should receive a statin um, for the purpose of reducing events? I do. Um, that's open to debate. I acknowledge that. Um, I think um, clearly um, there was an effect in low to moderate groups, including people down to very low scores. Um, and so I think because people with HIV are going to live a long time and going to have a lifelong lifetime you know of inflammation uh, unless there's some drug that comes out judy that can take the virus out of the macrophages and t cells and eliminate entirely the reservoir and take out inflammation okay if that happens i change my mind okay but if we don't seem to be quite at that state yet so given that there's a lifelong uh, you know exposure to this inflammation um i i think that that is the case now when you go to your patient, they may say, huh, I'm 42 and my risk is 1%. Are you really telling me to go on a statin? I think it, it this is, reprieve is like a Rorschach test of how you view treatment. Are you a lumper? Are you a splitter? You know, are you, do you follow the, you know, the exact the study criteria? I think, you know, it's true that the risk is less in someone at 1% than it is at 10%. Um, so you could have a, a discussion the next year with that patient. But Reprieve will tell you, Reprieve tells you that A, there's risk of heart disease, even with people that are 40, okay? That's incredible. Um, and two, there is a therapy out there that, that can be used. If it's not used the first time you see the patient, it could be used again. I personally would do it, but, and I, and I also think that you'd be, really mistaken not to do it over 5%. I mean, that to me is, you know, absolutely, you know, um, clear as a bell, but I would even do it lower. But I think you could look at reprieve and pick out of reprieve how you, how you practice. But in my opinion, the data uh, can be concluded as the study conclusions, as the DSMB concluded, and the DSMB stopped the study because they didn't feel equipoise anymore, i.e. the statin should be prescribed for people 40 to 75 at low to moderate risk. So they kind of spoke. Um, so that's how I feel. But I can understand how it's, some, you know, some people would could debate me on that. Uh, but, you know, here we provide the data for people to, to look at and understand over time. 
So great, really a really important point um, coming from a colleague from USAID about you know many low resource settings where risks of cardiovascular disease may be high don't have lipid testing done routinely. Um, and so in thinking about how this gets implemented, do you really need to know the LDL to give someone a statin? And then also, do you how do you think people should be monitored when they're placed on a statin in terms of you know any kind of laboratory monitoring? Well, when you think about it, since we showed the um, efficacy from zero to 15, it kind of doesn't matter what your LDL is in the sense, unless you were in, a, in the baseline LDL didn't matter for efficacy. So I'm not sure how important it is. The only reason it would be really important is you know, if for some reason you had a familial, you know, uh, uh, um, cholesterol, you know, familiar cholesterol disease or, or you were heterozygote where you had a really known high risk of cardiac disease and you were a carrier of that or had the double mutation, there you wouldn't have any discussion. That person should be on a statin, period. But that is so rare that I, I think you could just make the case that you don't need it if you can't measure it. Now, I also... Measuring LDL repeatedly is such a fascinating thing. In secondary prevention, let's say someone starts at one uh, 200 and they have heart disease, right? You put them on a statin and you get it to like 120 or 140 and you, plat you pat yourself on the back. But in fact, in secondary prevention, it needs to be lower than 140. You need to add either maybe a PCSK9 or something. On you need lower is much better in secondary prevention. In primary prevention, I don't know if getting it lower than 75, what we got is gonna make more of a difference. That's a whole nother question, you know, and I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so I think if you really were like, wanted to be parsimonious about that, the easiest thing might be to, to put the person on it. And, you know, you know I don't think you're, necessarily need to measure the LDL. It does tell you if the person's taking it or not. So it's a gauge of adherence. Um, if the person's having muscle aches and you want to get them through it, you can show them the reduction saying, see, it's working. You know, I mean, like it, it can be used in different ways, but I think in a, in a, in a practice pattern for low, these kind of low risk patients who already have a low number. I'm not sure in areas where LDL is not available, how important it is to either measure it at the beginning or repeatedly. Okay, we're almost out of time. Just one more question that people have asked about anti-inflammatory agents and other biomarkers of inflammation. So first of all, were other agents like aspirin and NSAIDs controlled for? And then just any thoughts on if you could measure one biomarker to further yeah. counter people. What, um, we did allow people, right <laughs> yeah, uh, we, if I knew exactly, I mean, but uh, we did allow people to be on uh, an aspirin and NSAIDs and the, the numbers were equal and small in each group, particularly because this is a primary prevention. Well, NSAIDs is different, but aspirin is a primary prevention study. Um, if you had asked me based on the baseline data, the IL-6 would have been uh, maybe come to my mind as a, as a marker um, because uh, Peter Hunt and others have shown that IL-6 relates to other, in other studies to MACE and other disease comorbidities and HIV. Uh, I can tell you that we'll be reporting at CROI that um, the statins didn't, it, it borderline effect on IL-6, but not a huge effect. Much, much bigger effect on LPPLA2 and um, oxidized LDL. These are so one measures arterial inflammation and one measures um, oxidized LDL, which is part of the atheroma and foam cell formation, uh, bad actor in plaque formation. And it nicely reduces that, suggesting that this effect may be more at the plaque stabilization level than in a systemic immune biomarker. So that is an absolutely fascinating question. Uh, CRP was moderately affected, not hugely. So what we need to do is, and that's only in the sub-study. So what we need to do is measure all these biomarkers in the entire population and follow that and, and then look at what related to MACE 
and then see whether if you whether it's LDL relating to MACE or biomarker or both or neither or which one when you control for traditional risk. So it's such a good question and I can't uh, tell you the answer right now, only that <laughs> there's a few hints here and there, but I, it's a, a really important question. And maybe it's CD4 or Nader CD4, by the way. I mean, the, the biomarker may already be out there. We may not even, it may be right under hiding in plain sight. I don't know, we'll see. So a lot more to come from the study. So more data, neurocognitive issues, physical functioning, strength, and other things. So. Um, Steve, that was really terrific. Thank you so much. And if I could ask you to stop sharing your slides, we'll have just a couple of closing um, slides to close out our webinar today. Really great, great Thank question. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, so just a little bit of information about how to claim your CME, and also um, please provide feedback about the webinar. And this webinar will be um, available through the IAS USA website. So you can share with others who we think will benefit. Um, and also just some upcoming webinars uh, that are shown here, one on RSV, um, and then also on implementing long acting drugs for both treatment and prevention. So lots of great online CME and the um, also substance use um, series. So, and our virtual course for um, in December, that is December 12th. So lots of content here. Thank, thank you all so much for participating. And thank you again, Steve, for really terrific presentation. Totally my pleasure. Thank you, Judy, so much. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.